everyone's proud of their parents if they I want to go back to your dad again. I want to yeah. go back to Ed. Yeah. Um, you said he liked vaudeville. He was a vaudevillian. I think he was. If you look at his humor, if you look at his anecdotes, if you look at his ads, you know, you look at that, you know, vaudeville is dead, says that or whatever. Yeah. That is a vaudeville sense. So, and he always was a showman, right? Yeah, my father, my, my father used to sit in, in the backyard, not the garden. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and did he dream up those ads? Absolutely. He drew at the dining room table after dinner. He would take out a piece of paper and he'd say, "Honest dead is for the birds." Cheat, cheat, cheat. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, and and he would come up with these things and he'd write them, and you could see them in the dining room table. It'd go through the paper. My mother would say, "Ed, you're." You're, you're writing through, t put thicker paper there, please, because it's our dining room table and you've you got all these sayings on it. And why uh, did he never hire a publicist who said, you know, Mr. Mervish, uh, here's 14 slogans you can use, the ones you choose. Why did he, why did he say, no, I'm going to write it myself? Well, well, he did. He hired the public. He ran an ad. If you want to be a member of the Edline Club, send them in. And if I use your Edline, I'll send you a certificate and $25. And there are Edline Club members all over the place. <laughs> How did so, he dream this stuff up? You know, he, d he did sometimes have publicists, but you know, for the most part, uh, you know, he, I, th I think that was his fun. That, that was, you know, once, once he made a living, he, he wanted to, he said, if you could draw attention to yourself, uh, it gave you a chance to then offer something. But if you didn't deliver the goods, it didn't matter how much attention you drew to yourself. So. His, his thing was to deliver value, but you have to remember in the 50s in Toronto, it was a conservative city. And mm -hmm. if you ran a promotion and you brought the wolf girl from the Yukon, and she came by dog sled and ran out of snow in front of your store, and she went in and shopped, then the Toronto Star would say, wolf girl came from the Yukon and ran out of snow at Bloor and Bathurst and went shopping in a store. But after he bought the Royal Alex, they actually said the name of the store. So that's why he bought the Royal Alex. He thought this was a form of advertising that was for honest eds that was different than any other type of advertising. And that he would be in the newspaper every week he was open reminding people that the store existed. It wasn't just the theater. The theater, the store, the restaurants were all one person and one story. From giving away turkeys to putting on Pinter or putting on, yeah. it's, it's a life of in, in interest in people. And he would stand in the restaurant every day at lunch and greet the customers. And that takes some bravery, because you never know. What he wouldn't do is stand at the theater as the audience was going out. Uh -huh. And that was a dangerous place, but one show he thought he was safe. So when he did the gin game with Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy, he stood there at the door, and people came over. They said, Ed, this is wonderful. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate this show. And then one little old lady came over. She said, don't you ever do that again to me. I don't like shows about old people. Wow. You know, so no show is without its critic. The iconic one for me is giving away the turkeys at Christmas. Uh, it, it, well, he didn't start out giving it away. He, 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 that was meant to be a door crashing special. Right. And, and he always had a door crasher. And I think he started out you know, charging a quarter. But then times got tough, so he lowered the prices to zero. <laughs> and it, w it wasn't always people in need who come for the turkeys. It's a, it's a really very interesting mix. Because they come from all sorts of communities, they c and some people are, are in, in need, mm -hmm. but some people are not at all. And this is a social event. This is an opportunity right. to come and be at Honest Ed's and remember old experiences and old friends and see the staff. And so it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. There was one little old lady in the heyday of, of, of those morning specials, and Dad saw her coming out of the store, and he said, uh, you know, Hello, I see you bought the morning special. She said, yes, what is it, Ed? What, what's this good for? And it was, you know, to change the oil in your car. <laughs> so he explained to her, well, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a bargain on oil. 
She said, I don't have a car. <laughs> I said, what are you going to do with it? Oh, it doesn't matter what it is. My neighbor always buys it from me when I come home. I just stand in line so he can have the special and I get to speak with all my old friends. We all stand in line together. So, you know, they're, they're, life is more complex and more interesting yeah. than but on the when, surface. When, uh, yes, the turkeys were a door crasher. Yeah. And then they became this thing that happened at Christmas time, Christmas season. And that became a tradition. And it spoke um, very strongly about Ed as a citizen of Toronto. And we became aware that not only was he flamboyant, not only was he a vaudevillian, not only was charming, not only did he run a good store, but he had a citizenship sense of Toronto that extended to everyone. And as he grew in reputation from being an eccentric storekeeper to suddenly being a major citizen of the city, mm. for me that was one of the steps on that, when the public uh -huh. began to understand the depth of this man's commitment to the city. Well, he, he was a new immigrant. I mean, although he came <coughs> as a nine-year-old to Toronto, you know, from the States, from Colonial Beach, Virginia, uh, he always saw this as a place of opportunity, and he wanted other people to feel like it was a place of opportunity. And I think that uh, he didn't really preach very much, and he didn't really, uh, you know, it, it was interesting. For example, I could have done a lot better with my life if I'd asked advice more. But he wouldn't give advice unless he asked. And I didn't know I had to ask. So I didn't get as much help as I could have. You know, he was there to help me, all I wanted. Uh, but I always thought he was in charge, even when I was in charge. So there was probably a 20 year period that I was running things, and he was back leading. But back leading? Meaning yes. He was giving me opportunity. And making me, you know, th think that he was in charge, but I was making a lot of the decisions. You know, we sort of at one point separated things. He ran the restaurant and the store. I pretty much looked after the theater and looked after the art. And uh, at real estate, we sort of discussed together. And uh, you know, I had a lot of freedom in that. Uh, but you know, because you know, he was driven in the sense of wanting to have fun. He wasn't driven in the acquisitive sense. And so I didn't really... Inquisitive or acquisitive? Ac acquisitive, in the right. acquisitive sense. You know, and, and, and in that, in, in, and in not being acquisitive, you know, it was because he had enough means to do what he wanted to do with his time and his life. I, I have other things I want to do with my time and life that are more expensive than him. So I have to work at actually being successful at earning mm -hmm. a living more, although he was very successful because he earned what he needed and what he wanted. Mm -hmm. That's the, knowing what, what en when enough's enough is, is a pretty good thing. And uh, maybe the other vaudevillian sense that he had was a sense of timing yes. in terms of buying the Alex, in terms of <coughs> buying the real estate on King Street, in terms of, it was a sense of timing that seemed More uncanny. important things, in the sense of when to give me the keys to the car and stop driving because it wasn't his thing to do anymore. I didn't have to say to him, Dad, it's dangerous. He said, I don't want to drive anymore. He made the decisions. Yeah. So you know, that sense of timing about uh, when to go on a holiday, not to bother people, let people, you know, if you can't leave your business alone for a while and not phone back, then you know, you're not giving people a chance to prove that you trust them and they can do the job. Uh, who, who do you give responsibility to? You can't do everything yourself. How do you build a team of people around you? Uh, you know, those are, the, he, you're right about you know, that public sense of timing and that, but, and, and you need to be lucky with some of those things. Mm -hmm. but, but he really, uh, uh, he, he really, uh, you know, he chose to do things different. I mean, we're different people and we choose different types of people. We do things differently. But the idea that that you know you you want to rely on on the best people you possibly can choose, and I mean the great thing about the theater is you're surrounded by intelligent people. They may at times argue or quarrel or be difficult, but they're all bright. They could all probably make a better living doing something else.